This is Southern Cross News with Rachel Williams. More fruit fly larvae has been discovered, this time in a backyard at Georgetown. The latest discovery was found last night in the state's northern fruit fly control zone. Biosecurity Tasmania says it's continuing to do everything it can to eradicate the pest. Setting up more traps to catch the flies damaging our fruit. It's affected everybody. I think the, um, it's, there's been significant impacts on commercial growers and, and just simply the response has impacts on the backyard growers. I've been Minister now for just over a week and this is my highest priority, ensuring that Tasmania reasserts its fruit fly free status. In the past two months, adult fruit flies and larvae have been found in Sprayton, Georgetown and on Flinders Island. Larvae was also discovered in a grapefruit brought from a Hobart grocer on Sunday. And the pest is still sticking around. Just yesterday, more larvae was found in fruit at Georgetown. It doesn't have any impact at all upon the control area. This is simply a finding of in, in, uh, infected fruit in an infected area. And uh, we expect that to happen. The control zone currently includes most of the state's north. Fruit inside the area can't be taken to other parts of the state unless it's fumigated or been through a cold storage treatment process. So far, up to 100 growers have been affected. All growers are resilient. As I've said before, it could be rain, it could be hail. In this case, it's fruit fly. Um, and they're being very cooperative with the government and working very closely with it. We're already working actively with growers to ensure that they're not out of pocket. 100 biosecurity staff are on the ground working to control the pest. For Tasmania to regain its fruit fly free status, flies or larvae can't be detected for at least 12 weeks. We will continue to do whatever we, we can to be absolutely 100% confident that we've eradicated this pest. Monika Dadson at Southern Cross News. Hydro Tasmania is confident the state will manage a two-week outage to the Basslink undersea power cable. Routine maintenance in Victoria damaged the cable, forcing Tasmania to now run entirely on renewable power. The opposition says it's almost a deja vu moment after the last cable fault sparked an energy crisis. It's nearing three years since Basslink suffered a major fault, seriously risking Tasmania's energy security. Now the infrastructure is again damaged, this time during routine maintenance in Victoria. Basslink have advised that it'll be, uh, they expect to have it back on track uh, by the 14th of April. Uh, we will be monitoring this matter very carefully. Basslink says the damage is unique, requiring international expertise and equipment. An outage the company is expecting to be restored within a two-week period, based on its current advice. We are very uh, confident in our energy security. Uh, it hasn't been compromised and uh, that's our position going forward. The water levels are very high. It's almost like Groundhog Day. Uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Minister Groom at the time, heading into what we now know as a major energy crisis, said everything was going to be OK. Hydro Tasmania is confident dam levels will withstand the outage, significantly higher than the 2015 outage that followed a dry spell. Storage is now at almost 37%. That's extremely secure uh, for autumn and especially as we approach our wettest months of the year. It highlights again that we need to be more than 100% self-sufficient in renewable energy, otherwise we'll always be vulnerable to these things happening in the future. Basslink says the outage is unrelated to the 2015 fault, a fault that's now costing the state what's expected to be a long and costly legal dispute. From time to time there will be uh, concerns, uh, but we're monitoring this very carefully. We're very confident with our energy security going forward. Energy security for now relying on its own capabilities. Jacqueline Robson, Southern Cross News. The gun allegedly used in the shooting of an 11-year-old girl at Deloraine last year always fired slightly off target, a preliminary hearing has heard. Constable Stephen Denham told the Launceston Magistrates Court the bolt-action rifle he tested had a tendency to fire to the left and its accuracy could be affected by a crosswind. Phoenix knew it was shot in the face during last year's incident and survived. The alleged shooter, 25-year-old Nathan Richard Campbell, was in court for today's hearing. He's pleaded not guilty to causing grievous bodily harm and recklessly discharging a firearm. The case will now return to the Supreme Court in June. Mr Campbell remains on bail. 
Three men are in custody after attempting to evade police near Hobart this afternoon. The vehicle was spotted driving dangerously in Lena Valley around 3pm. Police deployed road spikes before apprehending the men in Moona. Three male occupants have been taken into custody and investigation will be carried out uh, determine, to determine the appropriate charges. Police are urging motorists to obey road rules with heavy traffic expected this long weekend. Tasmanian firefighters are responding to calls for help from Victoria. As peat fires burn at Tarang near Warrnambool, brigades from Prospect, Dilston and Devonport will travel across Bass Strait tonight to help with the response. Our crews will use specialist equipment during the operation. What these vehicles are capable of doing is laying down a foam blanket on top of the peat and that helps to suppress the fire but the added benefit is that it also controls the, the smoke that's being given off because the peat fire really does smoulder. 18 homes were destroyed during the fire's peak last week. The Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation is considering ramping up its industrial action if calls for more inpatient beds in the Launceston General Hospital aren't immediately met. The group today sent hundreds of postcards signed by disappointed patients to the Health Minister. The ANMF says more beds are needed to ease pressure in the emergency department. The flu season obviously is imminent and certainly if it's anything like last year um, there will be even additional pressures placed upon the emergency department and the LGH which is all the more reason why the solutions put forward by members needed to be acted on immediately. Health Minister Michael Ferguson has agreed to meet with ANMF members to discuss their concerns. Football on the northwest coast will usher in a new era this weekend. The Penguin 2 Blues will play at their new multi-million dollar home for the first time on a surface considered to be as good as the MCG. This football heartland has a new pulse. The Dial Regional Sports Complex is an $11 million showpiece, ready for the first bounce this weekend when Penguin plays Burnie in the Northwest Football League's Round 1. It's AFL standard, the surface is just unbelievable. We can have an inch of rain and you wouldn't even know, it just the drainage system is just unbelievable. Penguins football and cricket clubs have united under the Two Blues banner. While inside, the change rooms are sleek and spacious. Gone are the cold showers, all too familiar in some country footy leagues, replaced with top-notch facilities. There's so many wins from the football club to the cricket club. The school, which is right next door, will get to use the ground and it's going to be a great asset for our whole region. The Central Coast Council says it eventually wants to see AFL pre-season games played here. This weekend's local derby is expected to draw in 3,000 fans. They'll be well catered for, with a fully stocked bar and undercover seating overlooking the ground. Construction has taken 13 months, but the vision goes back 45 years, when the local head of Parks and Reserves first had high-flying hopes of bringing all of the town's sports together. I've still got the plans and all the minutes of the meetings. The main thing was to secure the ground at that time, because if we hadn't have done that, Somebody would have got part of it and would never have them. For 112 years, this was the home of the two blues. Penguin Oval, full of history, but also run down from decades of use. It's likely to be demolished to make way for new homes. We went through a really sad period last year when we, we had our last training run and we had our last ever game and we had our last ever drinks and, and, and now we're, we're over and done with that. Um, and yeah, we're, we're all looking forward to, to moving on. The club's new chapter to begin when the siren sounds on Saturday. Tom Johnson, Southern Cross News. Veterans, RSL members and politicians gathered in Hobart today for the dedication of 20 headstones to unmarked graves of World War I soldiers. The headstone project has dedicated 246 headstones since 2011. We're not casting any blame on them for the fact that these men are in unmarked graves because we know a lot of the circumstances and it's not their fault at all. But it's just nice to have them participating in it, and that's part of, the, part of their heritage as well. 70 more headstones will be added by the end of the year. The world-renowned Indigenous performance Juki Mala is returning to Hobart. Originally a social media sensation, the dancing group is well known for its contemporary twist on the Indigenous tradition. The show is so popular it's adding a third performance to its Hobart tour.
like coming from a small island, small remote island, like coming to the city and going overseas and traveling around the world and performing and sharing our culture. It, it really inspires um, like many young generations. This show, it challenges that Western anthropological view of, of Indigenous Australian, um, certainly places it very firmly in the 21st century. The opening show begins at the Spiegel Tent in Hobart tomorrow night. Aspiring Tasmanian firefighters have had a taste of life on the front line today. The Tasmania Fire Service teaming up with Tasmanian Police to offer a program giving at-risk youth confidence and employment skills. These young men are facing their fears. They are part of Project Booyah, which aims to re-engage and educate teenagers from disadvantaged backgrounds. With training scenarios and simulated demonstrations like this, the TFS hopes to give them skills for life. We've run them through some pretty hard things already this morning, but they've shown a fair bit of resilience already. Just to give them a taste of what they could achieve um, and also to get them out to try something different. Um, one of the young lads as we walked in said that he'd love to try out for the fire. So, you know, it's giving them those options as career paths that they can do this. A road crash scenario was also set up for the participants to witness firsthand how emergency services respond. These guys as young drivers on the road, look, as you can probably imagine, they, like young people in vehicles, it's, it is a, a major cause of accidents for us on the road. So it is something we're exposed to a lot and we want to show the other side of it for them so they can see what we do when we turn up and how we try and help the community in that way. Several of those involved in today's program are now considering a career with the TFS. Ruby Kamein, Southern Cross News. Tasmanians are being urged to roll up a sleeve this Easter and give the donation that could save a life. The Red Cross is scrambling to fill its blood bank with the long weekend typically a time when demand is high. The Hobart and Launceston donor centres are open Easter Saturday with all centres open on Monday. We'll now look at the day's business and finance news thanks to TASPLAN, your local super fund. The Australian share market has closed lower with weakness among mining and energy stocks and a dip in ANZ outweighing modest gains elsewhere for the big banks in lacklustre pre-Easter trading. The ASX 200 index has dropped by 30.1 points. And a short time ago, the Australian dollar was trading at 76.7 US cents and 106.49 New Zealand cents. Clarence will field up to 10 new players for this weekend's Eastern Shore Grudge Match, with the side wary about peaking too early following their straight sets finals departure last year, while Lauderdale will look to put 2017's gutting grand final loss behind them in the best way possible. Having lost some of their biggest stars in the off-season, the Clarence coach had this message for his new look group. And to take the games to another level, but also their leadership as well. So, um, look, we've lost Ian Cullen and Sam Siggins, who are losers of our footy club, and Michael Fisher as well. But, um, you know, guys have got to come in and um, fill the void a little bit. With a string of fresh faces set to don the red and white for the first time, Webberley is hoping a lighter workload this pre-season was the right move, but he isn't expecting to see immediate results. Mentally we think that they're, they're fresh, um, so we haven't tried to overload them that way. Obviously physically they're it might take them probably half the year to get up and going. Missing some key names of their own, with state player Dylan Fife and midfielder Max Clevercamp shifting into state, while Thor Boscott is expected to miss the first six weeks with a broken foot. The same amount of time the side will be without suspended coach Darren Winter, who's been instructed by AFL Tasmania to keep his distance from the coach's box. We've pretty much covered everything that we need to cover during the week, so if anything goes wrong on the day, we've, we've already talked about what, what he would like to see happen. The Bombers are also set to unveil their three new Indigenous recruits who've made the move from the Northern Territory to progress their football careers. One thing that we've identified in the last couple of years is we've got a lot of players that are similar in speed wise. You know, they can win their own footy, but we don't have guys that can break the lines, and we think these guys can help do that. This Saturday's historic match at Penguins' new home ground marks a new chapter for another club too. It will be Bernie's first game back in the Northwest Football League after dropping out of the TSL. The club has seen a turnaround in player numbers and volunteers, while sponsors have remained on board. A return to the State League one day is not being ruled out, but for now the club is focusing solely on the local league. Probably one of the, the, the great things that have, has improved our numbers is being able to actually re-engage and form an under-18 side, and um, that was certainly the, the missing link that was very instrumental. Um, you know, in, in us not gaining numbers for our development league. 
Devonport will also mark its return to local football on April 7 when it lines up against Ulverston. To cricket and Tasmanian Tigers coach Adam Griffith has slammed Brisbane's Alan Borderfield after lengthy rain delays diminished the side's chances of win in the recent Sheffield Shield final. He's also wasting no time preparing for next season, already re-signing several players to the list. With the Tigers' hopes literally washed away in front of their eyes, Griffith wasn't shy about voicing his opinion on the choice of venue. You know, when you've got a first-class venue that it hadn't rained the day before and then rained the day of the game, but yet you don't get on and there's no lights and uh, you know, an outfield that doesn't drain well, then perhaps it's not a first-class venue. Losing one full day of play, along with multiple rain delays which stretched on for hours, the Tigers were forced to go for broke on the final day, with Alex Doolan and Jordan Silk producing a gallant effort at the crease. You're watching a bat and we think, gee, we could get 250 in front here and have 60 overs at them. But then you start thinking, well, if we can score 250 and 40 overs, then how are we going to bowl them out in 60? But despite the loss to the Bulls, Griffith had nothing but praise for the group, who rose from the bottom of the Shield ladder to dominate the back half of the season and set up their first final appearance in years. Very proud of the group. Very, very proud. Um, you know, from where we were uh, at the start of pre-season to where we are now, uh, they've shown great growth. With the dust settling, the focus now shifts to list management for next season. Having already re-signed half a dozen players, Griffith is confident the rest of the group will follow suit, along with some up-and-coming local talent. We're really excited by some of the young talent uh, we've got coming through our pathway, and, and I think you'll see once we announce our list for next year that there will be some uh, young Tasmanians on that list. Good evening. We've had a cloudy day with some showers in the west. Hobart recorded the state's high of 22 degrees. It was 20 in Launceston, Devonport and Burnie. We saw below average temperatures across the state, with most areas reaching a top of around 20 degrees. Mariah Island and Grove both hit 21. It was 19 on King Island and at Low Head, 17 at Strawn and 14 was the top at Liawini. Taking a look to the sky, today's satellite shows low cloud over the west with some scattered cloud over eastern areas. Zooming out now we can see that cloud was caused by an approaching cold front and there's a ridge of high pressure producing low cloud on the southern coast of the mainland. Tomorrow that cold front will cross the state in the morning, moving off into the Tasman in the afternoon as a high sits in the bite and tracks across Tasmania through the day. On the waters, northwesterly winds reaching 20 to 30 knots before easing to 15 to 25 knots in the evening, swells to 4 metres in the west. There is a gale warning current for southeastern coastal waters between Tasman Island and southeast Cape, with a strong wind warning for the rest of the coast as well as Storm Bay, and a small craft wind alert for the lakes. Morning showers for Hobart tomorrow were top of 18, showers easing and 17 for Hewenville, Campania 19. Launceston, an early shower or two reaching 21 degrees. Showers for Devonport, 18 the top, 19 for Georgetown. Morning showers for Burnie and Wynyard, both looking at a top of 18. Straw and showers, 17 degrees. St Helens, mostly sunny, 20 the top. Swansea, 20 and 18 with showers for Port Arthur. UV still in the moderate to high across the state. Now let's look ahead to Saturday. Fine across the state, apart from some showers about the west. Easter Sunday will see showers in the west extending statewide from late morning, although the upper east coast might remain dry. And more showers on Monday contracting to the west and south in the afternoon. Looking further north tomorrow, showers for Brisbane, 29 the top. A mostly sunny day for Sydney, also 29. Adelaide, partly cloudy, a top of 23. And 23 with a sunny morning for Melbourne. Looking at the current conditions around the state, Hobart 18 degrees, mostly cloudy, Launceston 17, cloudy as well, and Devonport is 17. And that's all the weather for tonight, Rach. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Brit. Well, that's all your news for now. I'll be back later with updates. Thanks for joining us. Good night.